This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 292 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Our sponsors this week are Total Saddle Fit, Easy Signs Online, and Mill Creek Spreaders. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. Glenn the Geek here, and we are bringing you a best of episode as Reese and Philip are enjoying the holidays. But they requested a certain episode be replayed again, uh, one of their favorites from the year. And of course, it's a World Equestrian Games year, so they had an episode related to that. We all hope that you had a wonderful holiday, Christmas, and you have a very happy New Year coming up. Today, we replay for you. Episode 275, and was called Jet Lagged from Germany. And you, this is, of course, Laura Graves returned from Germany, where she did an amazing fifth place at the Freestyle at the World Equestrian Games. You know, she was the surprise breakout for the United States team. And uh, it was a fun interview. We hope you enjoy this replay. If you didn't hear it the first time, it'll be fun to listen back. And if you did, it's just fun to relive certain moments like the World Equestrian Games. Reese and Philip will be back next week with brand new programming here on the Dressage Radio Show. Happy the rest of 2014, everybody, and we'll see you in 2015. This is Reese Koffler Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Fergus, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. Well, welcome back, Reese. Hi, Philip. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing okay. I'm a little tired. But, uh... <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, um, Philip and I actually just got back from horse shopping in Germany, Holland, and Denmark. Uh, we got back kind of late last night, so I, I am definitely a little jet lagged. How about you, Philip? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have, I'm gonna have to apologize. I know that there's probably gonna be a lot of editing yes. for Glenn to do in this show because I don't know if I, I don't know if many people know this from the show, but I have a zoning out problem. <laughs> that does. usually gets edited out, but I think it's going to be bad today. I'm just, you know, feeling <laughs> tired. I got up early this morning. We actually went to, we took a mare of a client of mine to a mare, um, what do you call it, performance test or evaluation with the Hanoverian Society. So, you know, we landed yesterday. I got some sleep, got up early and got this mare over there. Three years old, first time going anywhere. You know, and uh, it's, well, for anybody that's been to these shows, there are a bit of a, you know, there's lots of young horses there and, and foals and stuff. And it's it's a little bit crazy. So I had a big, you know, kind of a long day. And, <laughs> and here and you then, are. But that's horses, but that's horses. You know, one this day you're horse. in Germany, next day yeah. you're at a mare show. For Hannah Marion, right? <laughs> it is, and we uh, we were we had quite quite a good time. We went all over northern Germany and uh, saw sort of the German breed, uh, Hannah Marions and Oldenburgs, and then we uh, went uh, to Denmark and we saw the Danish horses, which is sort a, of a, a blue horse. A Come blue on, horse. We blue went horse. to Blue Horse. It was oh, no. wonderful. It's if awesome. anybody gets a chance to go there, it's it's a really cool place. Quite we'll we'll place. post some pictures. Of Philip uh, at Don Shufaro. He's like, take my Don picture. Shufaro, yeah, take take my yeah. photo. It was pouring my, rain. Pouring he was out rain. in a mud puddle. I yeah. Said, I don't care. Take my photo. Let's take Don my Shufaro. photo. <laughs> yeah. And then we um, have a photo uh, that we went to Holland. We were about close to Amsterdam and then went south. And um, that was awesome. And we have a photo that we'll post of us uh, with Bonfire. Well, so not, it was not a, bonfire, but bonfire statue. Oh, sorry. The statue that's in uh, Arab. In Anki's home time, town in <laughs> Arab, uh, Netherlands, near um, Sehertenbosch. There is a statue of bonfire, and I heard they're putting up one of Salonero. So yeah. that was and really in cool. This park. Yeah, it's in this really? park. We just sort of yeah, pulled our little. Yeah, tax like in a roundabout it. almost, right? You know, mm -hmm. on the side of the road. Yeah, it was funny. It was it was fun. So we were gone almost a week. So uh, uh, we we had the show all organized, but um, it was a lot of fun. It was really educational, and uh, we really enjoyed it. So bought some. Oh, well, hopefully we'll buy some nice horses. So uh, that was fun. So uh, Philip was awesome. It's good times. Yeah, yeah. So well, that's why we're tired, and maybe this show will get a little off track. Right? <laughs> Yeah, we're, we'll, we'll be efficient. Um, so, Philip, we've got, uh, obviously, awesome news from the World of Equestrian Games. Should well, we just do a quick rundown on that? Let's do it. I mean, I mean, you probably have been following it online. You know, this is not new news. So, uh, yeah, let's just, you know, let's give, give the medal winners and all that. And, and then we can get on to our show, which is going to be awesome because we have, you know, new, new star, shooting star of America, Laura Graves on the show. 
Yes, really I know. She's been, yeah, we're really excited to have Laura Graves on the show. And we have our friend Gerilyn Finn, who is an FEI rider and trainer um, from Virginia. She is, she went to the WEG. So she's going to give everybody a really great perspective on what it was like to be a spectator at the WEG. So a fun show tonight. So uh, we'll start off with Germany wins uh, the gold team medal. Uh, which we were in Germany when that happened, and everyone was ecstatic. They're pretty yeah. happy about that. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Good Great time. Great Britain to be there. silver, Netherlands bronze, and the big surprise—not a medal, but USA. I guess it's copper, right after bronze. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know. Fourth actually. place for USA. That was amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, no, no, it's good. It was really exciting it's for all of those teams. So very, very well done. Uh, we have Vallegro and Charlotte Desjardins, who's my favorite. Um, they won the Grand Prix gold, Damon Hill the silver, and Desperado bronze. And for the freestyle gold, Charlotte Desjardins and Vallegro, again my fave, Damon Hill and Parseval um, from the Netherlands were bronze. So uh, really, really a, a wonderful games. There's stuff online all over about it. You can see the rides, and we would definitely encourage everybody uh, doing that for sure. Check it out. Yeah, I mean, awesome. I think it ran fairly smoothly for all those, you know, for the riders and stuff. Um, you know, something to note, you know, that I that I saw from the scores coming up and all that, there were a ton of riders, you know, 70% and above, and lots of riders in the 69 percentile. I mean, these scores just keep going up and up, and and a lot of a lot of competitors from uh, all over the world are are now you know getting their game together, and and I think it's really getting very competitive up at the top, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I mean, really, if you don't have almost getting close to 80 percent, you're just not going to be competitive, and that's definitely different than it was many t- many you know even 10 years ago so i think it's it's becoming you know you've got to be up in that range and in the u.s um laura graves and stephen peters and um adrian lyle and also tina Konya. really they were uh, almost everybody was in the 70s so uh, that was great for our team for sure well, right after this commercial break, we're going to have Gerilyn Finn, FEI rider and trainer from Virginia, on the show to tell us what it was like to go to the World Equestrian Games. One of the most common and dangerous saddle fit concerns is the restriction of the shoulder's freedom to move. Some saddles slide over the shoulder blade while riding, some permanently rest on the top of the shoulders, and some pinch behind the shoulders, which inhibits full movement and leads to soreness and poor conformation. Short of buying an entirely new saddle, what can you do to give your horse the comfort to freely move his shoulders and perform at his highest potential? The saddle fit solution you have been waiting for is finally here. TotalSaddleFit.com is proud to introduce the Shoulder Relief Girth. This strategically shaped girth actually moves the girth line of your saddle back over one inch, thereby freeing your horse's shoulders from the saddle. Traditional girths pull saddles up against a horse's shoulders and often over the top of the shoulders. The shoulder relief girth's recessed ends allow for the billets to buckle into the girth farther back to give your horse unparalleled freedom of motion. An added bonus to the shoulder relief girth's unique design is the elbow comfort feature. The recessed ends designed for saddle fit now relieve pressure for elbow comfort as well. Similar girths can be purchased for over $275. But thanks to the enormous popularity of the shoulder relief girth, we are able to offer them for only $124.95. We are so certain that your saddle will fit better and your horse will be more comfortable that for a limited time we are offering a 30-day, 110% money-back guarantee. If you are not totally satisfied with your shoulder relief girth, send it back for a full refund plus 10% of the purchase price. Don't wait. Order now for the best saddle fit solution available. Well, this evening, we are so happy to have the friend of our show, Gerilyn Finn on. She is an FEI rider and trainer and owner of Finesse Dressage on. How are you tonight, Gerilyn? Doing really well, Reese. Thanks. Nice to hear from you guys. I know, and it's your anniversary, so you're taking one for the team tonight. You have to thank your husband, for sure, uh, for coming on the show, so thank you. Yes, you bet, no problem. You were such a star, because I followed your trip, or or the WEG in France, on your Facebook page. 
So I just thought it would be a lot of fun to have you on the show uh, to tell us all about your trip to France. Um, well, I'm glad that you found my Facebook posts entertaining. Sometimes they can be annoying, I suppose. So at least I know I didn't fail totally. No, <laughs> not at all. Not annoying at all. No, yeah, no, fun. Not annoying. <laughs> Good. I had a great time. Uh, it was an amazing experience. Um, I, uh, I, I'll just sort of tell you all about it. Um, we, Please. My husband and I went together, actually, for the first couple of days, and it was a, it was a package, like a tour, um, that was put together by Equestrian Tours, which is a company out of Vermont, and um, they had donated this package um, to the Vince de Ramos uh, handicap riding program fundraiser this winter down in Florida, and I was the lucky winner of it at auction. Awesome. So I didn't quite know what I was going to get. Um, <laughs> so it was really an interesting experience. Um, we got there and uh, in Paris, and all of a sudden it occurred to me for the first time that, oh my God, I've signed up for a bus tour. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, oh I never crazy. really oh, thought yeah. about that. Like, oh. <laughs> and I get really, 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 really car sick. Oh, so, no. Um, no. That was sort of, yeah, it was a little bit like, Chevy Chase, like, vacation in the movie, you know? <laughs> like, nice. oh, my God, I can't yeah. believe I'm on a bus. <laughs> but um, they did, I mean, the, log- the company was amazing. Their logistics were awesome. I think there were, like, 150 people that they were serving with this tour. Oh, my god! And all the people that were there, part of it, were wanting to see different parts of the WAG. So, logistically, I have to say they did a really good job. Um, the first two days when we were there, we were... Um, we were on a tour to, we did the Normandy beaches and then we did um, the opening ceremonies. And then we did uh, Mont Saint Michel. So they had this sort of like pre horse part of it, which was really nice. And my husband enjoyed that. And then yeah. the first day of the horses started on Monday and um, he was really good for like the first 30 minutes of watching the dressage. And then I lost him, like, totally. <laughs> 30 <laughs> minutes, okay. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Okay. So, so he was kind of a trooper, and he got through the day, and then, um, so I didn't see all of the Grand Prix that first day, because we kept doing other things to try to entertain ourselves. Um, <laughs> and then he went to visit, my sister lives in Paris, and so he went to visit them, and my friend, who used to be a customer of mine, who lives in London now, she came and joined me, and we got to watch the rest of the horse show together. Um <laughs> Show. That's what it is. Well, hang, hang on, hang on, Geraldine, really hang fun. on, hang on. Before you get too far, I want to hear a little bit about the opening ceremonies because um, I did not. Ah, I didn't okay. See I'm not much. your. I'm not your. I'm not. I'm not your person for that because I skipped it. Oh, you skipped no. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. that's funny. All right. Well then. then and actually, mind. but I, I mean, I can tell you that everybody that went to it thought that that ceremony was really amazing. The logistics were really bad. Um, they had only one opening to get people into it. It was really crowded. It took hours. And, like, I was sitting in our hotel, and the people, there's about maybe 100 people on the tour in our hotel. And when they came back, they, were, they didn't get back until, like, 1.30 in the morning. Oh, wow. Because um, it, it took forever to get everybody on the buses. It was just a little bit of a nightmare. But it kind of warned us that it could be that apparently opening ceremonies are sort of a, a trial run, you know, for the event organizers. And so oh, they were hoping dear. it would be better after that. Um, so I didn't do the opening ceremonies, but I heard they were really good. So sorry about that. Well, that's okay. No, that's, that's okay. That's but I have heard that there were some <laughs> logistical issues in general with this wag. Um, yeah. There were a lot of yeah, that, that think, kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, the scope of it was really interesting because you had um, so, sort of, you had three venues three venues in um, the city of Caen, C-A-E-N, and my French is terrible, but that's how I think you say it, it's Caen, and, um, and so you had dressage there, and you had raining happening that week, and you had terror dressage happening that week, and I don't know if there was something else happening in the city, and then an hour outside of the city at Haras Dutin was the um, event thing that started later in the first week, um, so Nothing was particularly close, so they connected things in the city with a shuttle bus system that was vastly under-supported. I mean, you're talking about 10, 20,000 people in the four shuttle buses that had like a two-and-a-half-mile route. 
Oh my God. Uh, it was terrible. Yeah. Like if you weren't capable of walking long distances, you weren't going to get anything done um, oh for the, even in the city. Yeah. So, but that to me is like typical French. Um, my sister lived there for a number of years and she's just sort of, there's just so many things that the French do well and logistics are not one of them. <laughs> so anyway. Um, I love it. <laughs> That's sort of the going, and then that and, and waiting in line. I've just, you know, everybody came home from the opening ceremonies, and there was just all a Twitter because, oh my God, and the people were cutting in front of me, and I, nobody was making a queue, and I thought that's what people do here is they make a queue. And, and I'm like, no, 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 it's, it's France. You, you have to cut. Like, there is yes. no line. They won't even know that you're there. You have to, you have to push your way. Right so, oh my anyway, gosh. so yeah, so it was, it was, it was France, but it was still. I mean, the event itself was really well organized. The stadium was fine. I'm not sure if you guys heard about this, but the the stadium where the Dufault was was all um, it was a big soccer stadium, so quite robust, and it was nice because most of the seating was covered. So when it was raining, only the riders were getting rained on, not really us. That's but, nice. Um, the bathroom. The bathrooms. Did you guys hear about the bathrooms? Oh, no, I, I kind of. Tell us about the bathrooms. <laughs> so they're what they call Turkish toilets. Oh. Um, so they're, for the women's bathroom, they just holes in the ground. Wow. So, you know, I had so many of my friends were like, you know, like, you know, in their 60s or whatever that are there to do this as a vacation. And they're like, oh, my God, I, <laughs> I got to go somewhere else. I can't stay in here. I don't know what to do. So it's a uh, hole in the ground. So that was really kind of huh. classic. Um, wow. Yeah. That's intense. Yeah, you can cut that part uh, out of the intense. family show if you want. <laughs> no, I love it. No, that was a huge complaint actually for the whole wag where the Turkish toilets. Like I've heard about that. No, you did hear this. Okay. Yes, yeah, I've heard yeah, about it. Something yeah. Something about that. Yeah. Well, how was um, I mean, the stadium? I mean, they, yeah. The how, how was the stadium was and the um, riding? And... Yeah, the stadium was good. They had, I thought you had like a really good view. I actually went to the London Olympics with my friend as well. And that was amazing, but you were really far away kind of from almost all the seats. Um, this was much more intimate, actually. We were really quite close. It felt like you could see it a lot better. Um, and they had open seating. So you had a ticket that was for like a section, but not for a particular seat. So the end result of it was actually that they never really checked the ticket. So the first two days, um, once you got in, you never really, had to, you didn't, they didn't bother you. So I kind of sat wherever I wanted, and I was moving all around the stadium, which was great, because it wasn't very full the first couple of days. You could do whatever. And then for the special, and then especially for the freestyle, it was packed. Um, but it was still the same thing. You kind of could sit wherever you wanted to sit if you could get a seat. So that was kind of nice, actually. That worked yeah. out pretty well. Cool. Well, anyway, how, how were the um, rides? How did the rides end up? Riding was awesome. It was so fun. I think... To have 100 people starting in the Grand Prix um, was really, really interesting, I think, from, from my standpoint. This is being sort of a national-level rider. I, you know, not everybody is Stefan Peters or um, Ula Salzgitter, or uh, uh, not Ula Salzgitter, this is the German work, this is the worst. Um, you know, there's normal people that are trying to do this too, which was really cool. Um, and they all did, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of good ride, a lot of good riding, but not always perfect. And I, I thought that was actually really refreshing to see, um, to see all these other countries that are trying to, you know, chip away at it and get up to the level of, of Germany and Netherlands and U S et cetera. So, um, and Great Britain. So it was, um, it was really fun to see such a diverse group because, when you go to the CDIs here in the States and, you know, there's 10 people and then you go to another CDI and there's the same 10 people. <laughs> and yeah, I saw all the same true. 10 people here at the WEG, which was great, but it was nice to see everyone else's version of the, of their 10 people that do their CDIs in the country. It was really cool. Um, there were some complaints, I think, about the footing. Um, the first day with the rain, they had rolled it to make it really tight and to get the rain to run off of it. But, I mean, it, it, it did maybe look a little bit hard, but I have to say I never saw a single horse slip, which is probably the most important part. Well, there's, um, al there's always complaints about the footing. It's never, you know, perfect for people. And, right. you know, it's one of those things. 
You know, somebody right. likes it a little right. harder. Somebody else's horse likes it a little softer. You know, but I think right. in rain, as long as you're not riding through puddles and horses are slipping around, you know, that's the best. You know, that's pretty good, right? That's yeah. the best they can do. Yeah, I think it was. Um, I think it was uh, as successful as it could be under those circumstances, right? So, um, and then after it dried out a little bit, it was it was good. I think. Um, you know, the one thing that's always a little bit of a bummer about these big events is they don't let you see the warm up. Yeah. Um, which is a little weird because you just you really like to be able to see what's happening just before they come in the ring as well. Um, so that was that's always a little different. But that was the same thing with the Olympics. They just don't give you that kind of access. Um, but uh, you know, it was it was awesome, and I, I was so impressed. I mean, those horses, they all were just amazing about the environment. I mean, I can't really think of anybody who had a complete. Not there was. I gather an Australian rider who couldn't get her horse through the tunnel to get into Ooh. the stadium. She had to, oh, she had to get terrible. off and run it in. Oh, God. Um, and, and she got off and ran it in and, like, threw a leg over just before they rang the bell and, like, for the regular Grand Prix. Oh, but, you know, I mean, honestly, there was very few horses that, that had meltdowns or anything. And uh, our team, obviously, was was really pretty pretty solid considering I – um, you know, the, the watching Charlotte um, Dizardine is an amazing experience. Um, watching the Germans, uh, Helen Langenhagenberg is, like, incredible. Um, they were – so it was really – it's awesome, you know. It's it's amazing what, what they do, what these horses are doing. Yeah, well, there's nothing, nothing <laughs> like seeing it in person. You know, we watch a lot of video, but I was just talking to Reese not too long ago about you never really get – you know a, a great impression on, on a video that you know if you if you want to see dressage and appreciate the horses you got to see them in person you know at least once right at least yeah. once you should yeah, see so. you should see what an 80 80 something percent ride is in person because right. it just it just doesn't do it i mean it's great that we have all this technology but it really just does, doesn't do it just doesn't do it justice and you know unless you're live yeah, not not as not as much really when you can see that the way it all is flowing together or what have you, and they're not cutting out to different bands or whatever. And I mean, I, I think it, those horses at the top are so close in so many ways. Their their quality. I mean, Damon Hill and Allegro are. I mean, they're just it's just lovely, you know. And I, 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 um, I think it's really nice. I guess you know the the top riders in our world at, at any given year you're going to have a collection of usually the same couple of them for a period of years, right? If everything goes well. And I have to say, Vallegro, Damon Hill, I didn't get to see um, Isabel's new horse. Um, our bus was late. Oh, no. <laughs> Getting to the stadium, and they had her ride at 8 o'clock on the second day of the Grand Prix. And so we couldn't, or, or the first day, I can't remember which day it was, but we didn't we didn't make it. We got there at 8.20. There was just no way with traffic and and being on a tour, it just didn't work, which was people were so upset about. Um, so I, and then she scratched for the latter part of the event, so I didn't get to see her. But um, I mean, those horses are so high quality. It, it's it's and the training is is so great because you just don't get the impression that there's a lot of tension. <laughs> you know, it's it's super fluid, super harmonious, um, and it's lovely to watch. And they have a lot of confidence. And um, I think that when do we get to talk about Laura Graves? Is now good? Yeah, talk, talk about, about Laura. Laura. She's coming on the show tonight, <laughs> so let us let us hear. Yeah, so I'm a big, a huge fan. I mean, I think everybody has to be to hear what she's accomplished and to see what she's done in such a short period of time. It's really, really awesome. Um, and so it was my first time seeing her. I actually didn't let myself watch any videos or whatever of her prior rides getting to this point. Um, and so I, I had nothing, you know, pictures, didn't know what color the horse was, nothing. And she comes in to the arena and I don't know if you guys have seen it or whatever, but you know, everybody that comes into these rings, they come in working, you know, I mean, Reese, you and I know this from Conrad, right? You go in and you work and your horse thinks it's working around the arena. It doesn't know the difference between being in the ring or being out of the ring or whatever. And, um, and she, she comes in on this giant horse at a crawl. I mean, she's just at a crawl. She's just tiny, quiet, step-by-step walk, 
wow. not doing a thing. And there's an enormous, you know, the crowd, they, they told the crowd to cheer before they come in and after. There's an enormous atmosphere. And uh, walking over, they walk past the gate. They just barely make it over to the judge at, at E or B before they ring the bell. So she just turns around at the walk, <laughs> it's like, and then picks up a can and goes in. And the first day, she had only one real hesitation with the horse um, in the in the collected walk. It it was a little spooky down at the judge. It didn't even spook. It just stopped walking for a moment, and she held her peace and gave the horse a moment, and then it carried on like nothing had happened. It was really impressive, and um, and the bond between her and her horse was so evident it was so cool it was so cool he trusts her so much and she did nothing to threaten that under the pressure of all this stuff that she did you know she didn't she didn't she never kicked she never pulled she never she never did anything to mess up that bond with her horse and her horse just kept answering for her every time she asked it was super cool it was really amazing that is awesome. Well, I love it. That is that is such a great story. And, and she's going to be on the show tonight and we'll get to hear her whole story. But uh, I think she definitely was the darling of the games by all means. And, and what a cool feeling to actually be there and to see it. So, um, yeah, Geraldine, we thank really you fun. so much for your time tonight and um, telling us the, the whole story cool. from a from a spectator standpoint. You know, I think that that's yeah. such a such a cool thing to do. So, Geraldine. Yeah, well, um, I'm how very can, lucky to be there. Yeah, absolutely. How can you? How can our, our listeners find you online? Oh, my website is um, finastrosage.com, and I also have a Facebook page with my name and with finastrosage, so you can pick. Awesome. Well, good? Jaylen, thanks yeah. again for coming on the show, and we can't wait to have you again. All right. Well, thanks for asking, Reese. Bye, Philip. See you guys later. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Right after this commercial break, we're going to come back with the U.S. um, big star of the World Equestrian Games, Laura Graves, and she's going to tell us all about herself and her story at the WEG. This week's Spotlight product from EasySignsOnline.com is their Outdoor Silhouette Cutouts. Made from a long-term outdoor durable vinyl aluminum material, these cutouts will outlast the old-style painted wood ones by many, many years. A great way to add an equestrian image to your barn, horse stalls, mailboxes, houses, or campers. Choose from dozens of equestrian or animal graphics online, available in two different sizes starting at only $59.95. And remember, free shipping on most orders over $100, all at EasySignsOnline.com. Get your silhouette cut out today. Well, it is really our pleasure tonight to have the American superstar from the World Equestrian Games, Laura Graves, on the show. Laura, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. Well, we are really, really thrilled to have you on. And we've been watching Philip and I, watching you through the whole games and cheering from, from Canada and from the U.S. And, and we couldn't be more excited for you. So uh, let's start at the beginning. I mean, you were here at the CDI did it in Kentucky and did a beautiful job. But how did this journey start? Um, you know, I've been with this horse for his entire life and actually the better part of mine, I guess, too. <laughs> um, so it's been when people say it's a long journey. Um, it is a long journey, and I've been really fortunate to have this long journey with one very special horse. Um, I've had him since he was a foal, and we've just you know kept plugging along and finding the best trainers that we could afford. And um, Well, I mean, just before yeah. you get too far into it, what made you decide – to, to buy a foal and, and, you know, how did you find this foal and what, what made you buy this foal? Sure. Um, a bit of dumb luck, actually, I think. We, when we were shopping, um, we had a very limited budget and that leaves you with limited options. And so those options for us were maybe to buy something, I guess I was maybe 13 at the time, and so with that budget, we could buy something with maybe a little bit of schooling, but was really not that great of quality um, and maybe a little bit older. 
or we could take a gamble on a fall, and we that's the route we ended up going. I rode some horses that were in our budget, and just nothing um, got me excited for a new horse. And so, Se- we, seriously, girl, when we, we're in Vegas for the World Cup, I want to go with you to the casinos. <laughs> I am super lucky. impressed. That's you are a gambling lucky. woman that I want to hang out with <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Actually, I have to give my mom a little bit of credit because she has such a super eye. She grew up with Morgan horses. And so when we were looking at all these videos of falls, she's actually the one who chose this particular fall. Um, and I think, yes, it's a little bit about skill, but it's a lot about luck. So, so what, is, what is his breeding? <laughs> just just says that interest. He, he is a Dutch bred horse. His sire is Florette Ass, which is a Westphalian stallion. Um, I think he's maybe still in Sweden. And his dam line is actually um, a harness horse. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I'm yeah. taking your mom. So, okay, I'm sorry. I'm not taking you. I'm taking your mom to the casino in Vegas. Just... <laughs> she, she, she loves it. She'll go. She'll go. <laughs> Fabulous. So, so you brought him up, you got him when you were 13. That's a, so, that's incredible. I know, I guess it's kind of been how we've done it. The horse I had before this one was the first horse we ever paid any money for. And he was a little quarter horse from Canada. And I guess I was, I don't know, fourth grade, something like that. And he was four years old. So, um, I've had I've had good luck with, you know, getting young horses that I like and have not um, turned me off from riding. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would think not. So, so how was it to to you know what what was your whole kind of development of an international horse? How did that work? Um, I think it was probably different than a lot of people who who know they have an international horse right from the beginning. I was extremely naive, um, and he grew up like a regular horse. He, I'm sure he's been fancy all of his life, but because I didn't know any better, um, he was in the field all the time. He had lots of pasture buddies, um, had a really, you know, horse-friendly upbringing. And then I had a lesson with Madeline Austin, who breeds Dutch horses up in Vermont, and she said to me, well, you know he's an international quality horse, don't you? And I, mm-hmm. uh, of course, of course I know that. Of course I know that. I had no idea, <laughs> and so and I had no idea. And so at that time, I thought, well, I better get serious about this. And that's when um, my game plan with him really changed. So what did you do? How did how did the game plan change? Um, at that time, I guess it was maybe late two thousand eight. I started applying for a working student position, and I figured if I'm going to do anything with this horse, he was six at the time, I said I'd better, you know, get to it because he's not getting any younger. So I ended up landing a position with Ann Gribbins down here in Florida, and I moved down here in the spring of 2009, and he was maybe going about second level at the time. And we just, it's just like you train any other horse. Um, You teach them the basics, then you teach them, you know, a little bit of the tricks, and then you go back, you make sure you know the basics. And it's, it's all the same, but some of them are just stars. And he, I'm really lucky that he's one of those. Wow. That is amazing. So, so kind of fast forward in the training to this winter uh, in Florida. How did you start to think? Okay, you know this this wag thing. This this could happen. Yeah, I mean, I think um, this wag has always been something I knew. If we were going to make a team, this would be the first year that we would have the opportunity to do so. Um, he's a really sensitive horse, and so him being twelve this year he would not have been able to handle this pressure any sooner than um, we we did. And so I guess last November, I was in a clinic with Debbie McDonald, and it just worked. We had two days of 
her coaching me in a way that it directly relates in that moment and improves your riding. And it's so amazing when you can connect like that with a trainer um, that you have to stay with them. And when it's a program, um, you know, with the horsemanship in mind, then it just feels the deal. And we spent all spring training, and it really didn't come together for us until until Gladstone. And wow, did you you finish second overall? It, unbelievable. Well, I wanted to make uh, a, I, uh, know. I wanted to make a point first. Is that when was your first Grand Prix? I think we did our first national Grand Prix in January. Yeah, incredible. And then, incredible. Um, and then we did uh, our first CDI in February. I think it was the end of February. Wow, that yeah. that's really. And if people don't know, you, you place fifth in the in the freestyle at WEG, right? in, correct? In the world. <laughs> yeah, we we finished fifth in the freestyle and. We finally broke that 80%. And, um, what do you mean? You finally yeah, broke. Oh, my God. It's your first year at Grand hero. Prix. You <laughs> finally it's broke. Been, like, That's amazing. It's been this huge goal that we've had. And people always, you don't want to sound foolish when you say things like this. Like, oh, I know I have an 80% horse. Because I, I feel that way because he's so fun. But what if he's really not? So, um, to have that happen was amazing. Now, of course, we go on and um, train for the 80% in the Grand Prix and the special. Wow. That is incredible. So so fast forward, okay, you're second at the WAG. Um, I'm sorry, you're second at the U.S. National Finals, and then you guys go to Europe. What was that like? Oh, my gosh. How did you handle this I, pressure? Yeah. I, I guess what I've been feeling like is it's not really that much pressure. When I... I came into Gladstone, nobody knew who I was, nobody expected me to place well. So it's a really nice position to be in because you can go and you can just ride your guts out. And if you have a bunch of mistakes, nobody cares. And if you do really well, then everyone's surprised. So <laughs> it's a really nice position to be in. And then um, we came to Europe and I was totally unprepared for that trip. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Why were, been... you, why were you? Yeah, why were you unprepared? What, what, what was going on? I I didn't even bring my passport to New Jersey, so oh. <laughs> I I I had nothing. I didn't have a tack locker. I literally drove my own pickup truck with my two horse trailer from Florida to Kentucky to New Jersey, <laughs> and <laughs> I had nothing. So thankfully, my boyfriend flew up and brought my passport for me. And um, we, I, I borrowed a, a tack locker, and I packed up my stuff, and they put me on a plane. <laughs> wow. And off you went. <laughs> you didn't have a choice, right? You didn't yeah. have a choice. They just put you on a plane. I love it. I love it. So when you get to Europe, what happens? What, what was going on? Um, first of all, we were extremely exhausted. We had been up by the time we landed in Amsterdam. We had been awake for at least 24 hours. And then, of oh. course, we drive from Amsterdam um, to uh, the farm where we were staying in Belgium. And we make sure the horses are all taken care of. And we finally made it to where we were staying probably 36 hours. Um, it was a 36-hour trip by the time we got into bed. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. It was exhausting, wow. but the horse was all shipped incredibly well. And that's, of course, the biggest relief, especially if you're a first timer. Yes, absolutely. So you, so you, get, to the, you get to the farm, and, and what was kind of your daily life when you were in, in training? It was um, the, all of the U.S. squad members, all of the shortlisted riders um, were stabled at the stud farm. And so we all just by nature, ended up riding a little bit at different times in the day. So we would all watch each other's school a little bit. Obviously, most of us just had one horse. So you spend a lot of time just watching your horse, watching him in the field, watching him <laughs> in his stall. <laughs> they are of extremely spoiled and well taken care of. Um, 
And I think getting back into my barn now with other horses is a tough adjustment for my horse. <laughs> sure. He's like, where's mom? I had her 24 hours a day. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm a star now. Yeah, that, that's I know. Awesome. He just bangs, bangs on his door and screams. He's like, how dare you touch another horse? <laughs> I'm fifth in the world. I think he's got a, a little bit of a point. He's got a point. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Put that up. But so, yeah. So, entering into your first European competition, what what were the thoughts there? Um, our first European competition was actually a really friendly one, which was a nice way um, for them to set it up for us. And we were in Austria, and it was just an amazing show aesthetically. They, the people who run the show, um, it's run by the Swarovski family and they are incredibly generous. It was just a nice show to be at as a rider. They're completely taken care of. The horses are catered to. Um, and it was just amazing. And the, the riders were all very nice. It was a very friendly stage. It's a, it's a real running farm. So it feels very much like going from one training arena to the other, as opposed to Aachen or WEG, where you enter into a, a big stadium. So you went to Fritzen. You were amazing. You were awesome. And then you guys went to Aachen, right? Then we went to Aachen. We had the Nations Cup at Aachen. And um, I think we had a squad of four for the Nations Cup. And then we had... Uh, maybe three individuals there as well. Oh my gosh. What was it like to ride Aachen? Like, that's like my goal in life. Like, that's amazing. What yeah, was that it was, like? It was really <laughs> awesome. To be perfectly honest, I was really excited because I felt like it was a, the perfect warm up for WEG. Being someone who's never seen a lot of these riders in person, um, it kind of gives you a chance to be totally starstruck and just be like so goofy and watch all these riders and watch all the horses so that by the time I got to WAG, I didn't, you know, I, my jaw wasn't on the floor. Yeah. You could be um, there done that, you know, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. You, do, well, that... you, have, you have to a little bit shut it off because otherwise you will spend um, all your time watching what everyone else is doing and you lose your own focus. Well, and that seemed to be what you were amazingly good at. You just stuck to your plan with your horse that you knew so well. And, I mean, that is, is totally to be commended. That takes riders years and a lot of sports psychology to do. And you did <laughs> – it's true. I mean, you just did an amazing job through all of these competitions right up to the WEG. I mean, here you are in the, in the main stadium at the WEG. What was that like? Oh, my gosh. That was that was mind blowing. That was the first time, um, probably with this horse ever, that I have felt like that. I actually had the feeling during opening ceremonies where we went through with the team, and I was like a kid in a candy shop. I was just jumping up and down on the inside. I was so excited, and I didn't think I would feel that way. But when you see people in the stands waving the American flag and you're in another country and these people have flown over from your home country to come and see you and your team. It's an amazing feeling. And to have that and then take it into competition. Um, I will say Tuesday was the first time that I felt pressure because I knew at this point people expected me to present a certain score. Sure. And, 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 yeah, the, and there mean, was you, pressure. You started yeah, to prove I mean, yourself and, and now people are looking for, for you to, to produce, right? I mean, yeah. That, and I think, tough. um, like I said, being at the bottom is maybe not a desirable position, but it leaves you nowhere to go but up. And when you start doing really well and people expect things, they sometimes forget that, um, Horses are horses, and humans are humans, and we're both likely and very capable of making mistakes. Um, especially, you know, I'm still a really green international competitor, 
and my horse is very green. And so every stadium we go into um, is a whole new experience for us. And I can't ever, or at least this year, I hadn't been able to 100% predict what horse I was going to have or how nervous he was going to be. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, you, I, you just did an incredible, you did in six months what people do in five years, you know, <laughs> like it's incredibly cool. Um, it's, but it, know, it's a good person. It's a good personality and a horse who just rises to the occasion um, because they, they won't all do that for you. Well, and just the bond that you have with them yeah, is, is incredible. A, yeah. It tells of a, a, of a wonderful partnership, obviously. Yeah. So, Totally amazing. Well, we were, again, I was jumping on the inside for you. I was so excited to see you there. I mean, I was like, really like, oh my gosh, this she is. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, like nobody expected a whole lot from the U S in this world of cross ring games and the team succeeded beyond expectations because of you. Yeah. It's very true. Yeah. And it's, it's a nice feeling, um, for me personally, but it's, I think an even better feeling that maybe we're changing the sport a little bit um, in America. And I think that's, that's more exciting because who knows how much longer this horse I have will be at the top of his game. So if a little change can happen now so that we have another horse and another horse, and we're finding people who maybe don't go to Wellington or don't go to California, um, there's a whole lot of country in between there. No, it's so true. Absolutely. And you know, yeah. I think it is. And in the fact that um you you can do this. Uh, you you like yourself finding Diddy a, a, as a foal and in Charlotte working for Carl Hester and getting the ride on Vallegro. I mean, it is possible. It is it is a hard way to go, but it is possible. And I think and like you said, a lot of people can't go to Wellington or can't can't travel to California or can't you know, it's so expensive. And, and I think that, that you just continue to show that. And I think that that really means a lot to our country for sure. Well, um, and so it is so expensive, but I think it's, it's important that we start realizing, you know, the, the people who can't afford to do it, um, still deserve a chance to, and just to, awesome. to pass it on. You know, if you have something that you can, give or donate or help a young rider, um, you know, pass it on. I love it. That is awesome. That is awesome. So, so tell us a little bit about if we could go through each of your tests real quickly, what was the Grand Prix like? What, how did you feel going into that? I was quite convinced I was going to get sick. I, I hadn't <laughs> eaten all day. I, I get, I, Sometimes I'm worried to eat because there's nothing worse than entering the arena and feeling what you just had for lunch, like a pit in your stomach. So I, I didn't eat breakfast. I think my ride was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And at my warm-up, we were pulling off my boots, and I needed a drink of water. And I said, I feel sick. You know, there's this, my stomach is so tight. And Robert said to me, oh, you're just nervous. And I said, I don't get nervous. I just have this feeling in my stomach. And he said, no, that feeling in your stomach, Laura, those are nerves. And it was, I, oh, it was a big shock to me because <laughs> I, I haven't had that in so, I haven't had that in so long. So you had nerves in the Grand Prix, but you went in there and you rocked it. Let's just be honest. You were awesome. So what did it feel like yeah. going into the special? Um, going into the special, I felt much more like myself. Um, I felt like my horse was reliable. Um, we had spent a little time the morning of the special, uh, what I call sugar training, where you take <laughs> them to whatever they're afraid of in the arena and you just keep feeding them sugar and sugar and sugar. So they really liked the thing that they were afraid of. And um I felt much more comfortable in this special and I wanted to go in and just put the pedal down. So that's what we tried to do. And he was amazing and had no real mistakes, which made me really, really proud. And he posted a super strong score. So 
um, that was that was a really amazing feeling for us because the ride felt felt really good. Which as a rider, that's what you really care about, not so much the score. Yeah, that's awesome. And so so you find yourself going into the Grand Prix freestyle at the World Equestrian Games. What did that feel like? I know wow. it. I know it. I just. I think to be dwindled down from that many competitors and the best competitors from all over the world was a bit of a shock. And um, luckily we'd been preparing for the freestyle. So, you know, we spent so much time making sure that my horse was good in the Grand Prix cast. And then all of a sudden he was good enough in the Grand Prix where he qualified for the special. So then we have to make sure we're good enough in the special. And then, in, in the past couple of shows, he's been good enough to get through to the freestyle. So we really had to focus our energy there. We realized that was the weak link in our program. And um, really from Aachen until WEG, we spent pretty much all of our training sessions uh, working on the choreography and the music. And um, so we would be prepared in the event that we, we made the top 15. So what was it like to finish fifth? Um, what was it like to finish there? Yeah, fit, it finished fifth in the world. I'm like excited for you. I'm like jumping out of my skin. I know. What was that like? I, I mean, we finished fifth. Um, I have to say it still leaves me hungry. I'm just so <laughs> competitive. Obviously, I, I could not possibly ask for a better year than we've had. Um, that would just be greedy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do have to say that, um, I I want to be the best. It's just in my nature to um, be the best that I can be, bring every horse, you know, to their full potential. And it'll just be an exciting year for us next year if everything um, stays on course. Well, what is, what is the course then? Tell us what's coming up. What's up for, for Laura Graves? What's her next surprise? Well, what's we have a lot going on. We have a lot going on now. Um, We are relocating and growing our business, which is a good thing. Um, We're also, obviously, Diddy is having some downtime. He has been showing nonstop since last October. Um, So he's just in the field, and he'll go for hats. And we'll see what happens in January. We're not totally sure what we're going to do. Um, I don't want him to be exhausted of showing. He's the kind of horse who really likes to go to horse shows, and I want to keep it that way. So there are a couple big events in 2015. Obviously, the World Cup, which is in Vegas. Would be amazing. your mom and I are going to the kid. We're going. To the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys have a date. Yeah, um, we do. All right. All right. <laughs> but the really important thing for our country will actually be the Pan American Games. Um, unfortunately, placing fourth at WEG as a team no longer gets us a bid to the Olympics. So if we want to send a team to Rio, we have to win the Pan American Games this year. Well, come on um, up and see me. It's actually going to be about <laughs> an hour, an hour from my house. Yay! I will have to do that. Yeah, you hang out. And and Reese and I's our tickets are booked for for Vegas as well. So exactly, exactly. Well, and Laura, can you tell us where you're relocating your business so that our listeners can maybe help you out in that department? Yeah, give us a website sure. and how to get in contact with you. Great. We are still um, staying in the Central Florida area, just outside of Orlando. Um, It's so nice and quiet here for the horses to be able to get away. Sometimes Wellington is just so busy. Um, But we're staying in this area, and um, the name of our farm is Cross Ties. So you'll find us online at crosstiesllc.com. Um, and there you can find my email and all of my contact information. And um, we've got a few weeks to get our ducks in a row, and hopefully we'll have some exciting news for everyone very shortly. Excellent. Well, we hope you'll stay in touch with us and come back on uh, and can just tell us how you and Diddy are doing in the future. Thanks for coming on. You're a busy lady right now, and we really appreciate it.
Thank you, guys. It was a lot of fun. So you've been thinking about getting a manure spreader? Well, here's why I think you should consider Mill Creek. They've been in business for almost 30 years with continuously improved designs to meet the needs of horse owners like you. At Mill Creek, models are virtually maintenance and trouble-free thanks to their exclusive sealed bearings. They're the only compact spreaders you'll find like that. Mill Creek customer service is second to none. Call them and you'll reach a knowledgeable person in their own factory right in Pennsylvania. With eight models available, they're happy to help you choose the right spreader for your budget and barn. Five models can be pulled with ATV or garden tractors. If you'd rather have a PTO drive, they've got those too. At Mill Creek, spreaders have the lowest sides and tongue weight of any on the market. One of the biggest problems we always had with our spreaders is they just rust. Everything rusts out and then you have to replace the metal and it's just a pain. If you don't want to ever have to worry about your manure spreader rusting again, then consider the Mill Creek Stainless Steel line. They are the world's first and only compact manure spreaders built out of stainless steel. And they're warrantied against rust through for life. Julie Goodnight, clinician and star of Horse Master with Julie Goodnight on RFD TV, has owned and used the Mill Creek Spreader every day for over nine years. She knows they represent great value and quality and is proud to endorse them. So for the best compact manure spreading equipment you can buy, check out Man- Mill Creek's lineup. Years of trouble-free operation will get you out of the barn faster and give you more time for your horses. Give them a call today at 800-311-1323 or visit their website at MillCreekSpreaders.com. The perfect holiday gift. This week's dressage training tip is brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, home of the shoulder relief girth at totalsaddlefit.com. Well, now we have the Total Saddle Fit tip, trainer tip of the week. Um, And we want to, again, thank Laura Graves for coming on the show. She's a busy lady right now, uh, so it was really fun to have her. So, Philip, what's our trainer tip of the week? We're well, doing it tonight. Yeah, this one we're doing. You know, we've been doing a lot of them, but uh, we've been getting a lot of great questions on, uh, you know, via the Facebook page and the email, and and uh, we're happy to try and and figure these out and help you, uh, you know, help the listeners with questions and training and give our perspective. So um, let's get right to it. I got this email here and from someone who needs help with her horse's walk. She says, I am currently showing first level and I am trying to prepare for the second level. Um, She says, I think I I recently received some bad advice. I was told to hold my mare in collected walk and practices as well as hold her going into canter from walk. But she wants to jig and get stiff during the working walk. This is not cool, not good, I guess, during my first level test. I was also working on walk to canter transitions, but I've put that aside until after our regional championships. There must be a better way. Things that I've done that seem to have helped, practice going from working walk to what I think is extended walk, not quite free walk, and back to working walk. I can have three nice steps of more collective walk before she begins to brace. So I try to let her back out before she braces. I have also been moving the bit around, gently massaging the mouth and doing some slight shoulder four. And I also play with this uh, while on the trail instead of riding in the ring. I guess she needs help with her working walk and not to be jigging and, in, in you know, preparing for the transition to canter and moving up in the levels, um, but not ruining her first level test. So. Reese, I guess, you know, yeah. you, I think we got lots of information here. Yeah. What do you I, think? I actually, I, actually, I think a lot of the things that she's doing would be exactly what I would tell her to do. I mean, I think she's doing a really good job thinking shoulder four. She's practicing it um, all the time, you know, which is excellent. I'm really happy that she's doing that, that she's practicing forward and back, uh, watching the neck as she's going through. That's excellent. Um, I love that she's practicing when she's on trails. Uh, I think a lot of times, you know, we all get a little, and myself included, get a little lazy out there and, and you're having a good time and enjoying your horse. But, um, you, you know, that that is really, really excellent. Um, 
So, I mean, there are a lot of good things here. Um, I think always when you're practicing tests, um, and, and I have one particular mare that I've trained since she was four. She's a client horse, but I've trained her since she was four, and she's 12 now. Um, she knows when that canter transition, canter walk transition is coming. So whenever we practice the tests, we are very, very careful to practice. We never canter in the same place. We always walk. We always circle. We always halt. So we're always cognizant of that, um, that sort of whole idea that she's going to jig it, it again it's it's a hard one to fix I mean they they're smart they know what's happening they know that that's coming so I think any time that you can do circles you can do walk um you know halt transitions from the walk um you can pick him up you can um and and go back to the to the free walk or or the extended walk depending on what you're doing I think that those are all really good things um and things that I would continue to work on um always watching the rhythm the rhythm and the walk is is hugely important um watching the activity being able to pick her up bring her back down um you know these are all these are all really really important things so i think you're on the right track i would also just tell you to don't get frustrated with it i mean it's probably something you're going to have to continue to work on um for a long time so um those would be my suggestions but overall i think she's doing a fairly good job of what she's trying to accomplish what do you think philip yeah, I mean, you're right. And I think definitely putting the, the walk canner aside for a little bit until after our regional championships mm-hmm. is a very good idea. Just, you know, just be practicing what you want to make perfect at the moment. And then, you know, as soon as it's over, you can go right to work on it. I think with a walk, I, I tend, you know, in a horse that jigs in the walk or starts to trot or whatever, I like to do a lot of lateral work. So not just for shoulder four, but definitely increase the angle the shoulder in and then increase the angle again to a little leg yield. There's no problem in doing that. And, and uh, you know, even in a, in a test, I don't think the judges hate to see a little shoulder in, you know, because when you get those legs going a little bit sideways, then it's very hard for the horse to start jogging a little bit. Uh, something else to be cognizant of is uh, the tension in the rider. I mean, you know, you want to walk with very little tension in, in it. And at this stage of the game, um, I would probably say stay a little more towards working walk instead of, you know, collected walk. And uh, do it, you know, do the transition a lot on circles. Be going from a smallish circle, 12 meters, 15 meters, towards, you know, pushing towards the 20 meter, keeping a little shoulder for, and uh, and then asking for the canter so that that hind leg is placed very much underneath the horse. They're moving sideways. And then, and then just boom, right, right into canter, you know. And, and it's okay to go to a forward canter. I think definitely um, don't be setting up, if your horse is not really comfortable in collected canter, you know, and they're having a lot of the tension problems, if you're going directly from, you know, from walk to a canter and the canter is a little bit tight, then let it out a little bit. I think that's, that's okay because, you know, always go back to, you know, be working the horse in a happy, relaxed place no matter whether it's collected or, 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 you know, a little bit medium or, or whatever, you know, whatever makes your horse the happiest to do their job. And then, you know, work on collected canter once you've established the canter and, and try and do it all with, with the tension out. Something, you know, that might be tricky to, to get across here and, you know, over the radio is that um, when I'm going from walk to canter, I like to take the horse's pole a little bit further down than normal um, you know, when you're in just working yes. walk, you want that pole, you know, up and, you know, above you. But as I prepare for my canter transition, I try and just bend a little extra, do a little bit of that shoulder, shoulder in and, and just take that pole a little bit. I, yeah. I don't want anybody to go extreme with this idea, you know, into any roll curve or anything like that, but just a little bit down that, that can help to raise the horse's back and, and release that tension because if they get a little tight in the neck or in the pole area, this is really, really common. Um, so you can just teach the horse to be relaxed and that's the same idea as, you know, not, not holding on and getting too much collection, letting the horse kind of roll forward with it and, and to use their energy in a, in a, in forward way and in a little bit of a sideways way, you know, make sure you hold that shoulder in all the way from walk into canter and then be shoulder in as you're making your canter. So the whole thing should feel that the horse has a lot of energy and some tension and that they can take that a little bit sideways and then you can slowly start to straighten it when you've when you've got the tension out 
and then go back to shoulder in a little bit and and a little bit lower with the pole and then you know it's a it's developing right you got to find what yeah. works for your horse yeah you got to develop it then you got to you know work it towards what you want in a test this i mean if you're just finishing on your first level of stuff for this year working towards your second level you know normally i recommend that that somebody if if it's their first year at second level be doing that level for two years yeah two years That's, in second level to get good at it because yeah it's, it's hard it's, it's one of the hardest jumps from first to second there's a lot of new stuff there can be a lot of tension so um again one year at it if if it's your first time or if it's a horse's first time is really not enough so you know keep, keep your patience don't get tight really be be aware of your own tension that you're bringing into the horse and 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 think okay all i have is time to work on yeah. this and to get it right and to do it a little bit and then to you know for a couple months stay away from it and then to come back at it you know be working on different there's so much at second level to be working on that you don't have to be drilling away at that canter walk walk canter canter walk walk canter it does bring tension into every single horse so be aware of that work on it think that you've got you've got lots of time to work on it and uh and you can get there it's no problem don't get discouraged i love it I love it. Well, great tips. Um, and but keep it up. Keep it up. You're doing a, you're doing a good job. So we love these emails and Facebook shout outs. Keep them coming. Um, again, if we don't answer the question, we will find somebody that can. So keep them up. We love the show and the listener participation. So this tip was brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, the shoulder relief girth that Reese and Philip both love. And here's why. The saddle fit solution you have been waiting for is finally here. TotalSaddleFit.com is proud to introduce the shoulder relief girth. This strategically shaped girth actually moves the girth line of your saddle back over one inch, thereby freeing your horse's shoulders from the saddle. Traditional girths pull saddles up against a horse's shoulders and often over the top of the shoulders. The shoulder relief girth's recessed ends allow for the billets to buckle into the girth farther back to give your horse unparalleled freedom of motion. We are so certain that your saddle will fit better and your horse will be more comfortable that for a limited time we are offering a 30-day, 110% money-back guarantee. If you are not totally satisfied with your shoulder relief girth, send it back for a full refund plus 10% of the purchase price. Don't wait. Order now for the best saddle fit solution available. At totalsaddlefit.com. Visit totalsaddlefit.com. You can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. You can follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com. And my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. You can find me at philipparksequestrian.com and my email is philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week for allowing us to put on our show. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we'll talk to you soon. 